I've asked the Spirit of God to help me today to just say what needs to be said, what He would have us to see and hear and understand and guide me as we work through this. A lot of scripture, so please just settle on in and let the Word of God wash over your heart and mind. Have an open mind and an open heart to what God has said. But the book of Isaiah, we're going to pick up here in a little bit in Isaiah chapter 9 when we get back into the book. You got problems? Say, yes, I got problems with your grammar. Touche. Do you have problems? Six to one, half dozen to another. You know. Do you have problems? Do you have problems at work? At home? Do you have problems here? With people at church? Do you have problems in your soul? In your body? In your past? In your future? The world at large has problems, doesn't it? Just go digging in this week's global news and you don't need a shovel to dig deep and uncover serious problems all over the world. In the weekly news, just pick up a spoon and start scooping. Problems appear right on top. People die every day, everywhere. People suffer every day, everywhere. People sin every day, everywhere. Governments oppress every day, everywhere. Corrupt people take advantage of the weak and poor every day, everywhere. Religious groups confuse and they discourage and they tie up their followers in knots of false hopes and myths and overbearing man-made religious expectations and that happens every day, everywhere. So you got problems? The world's got them too. Do you have problems? I want to try to speak to everybody. The world has them too. See, if evolution... The theory that we all evolved from sludge, if that was true, then surely by now a lot of these problems would have sorted themselves out after billions and billions of years of trial and error. And if that is also true, it justifies the wicked, immoral behavior of corrupt governments of the world, the strong and the powerful of the world as they oppress the weak. If Darwin's theories are true which is being taught as more than a theory in many schools across our nation. It is perfectly okay for the strong to oppress the weak. Survival of the fittest, no. Also, if the atheist, the secular humanist, the person who doesn't believe there is a God and they reject him and so they rely on their own thoughts or ideas... If he is right, then there's no point to this chaos. It's like a board game without a goal or how... An, a how do I win this game explanation when you begin the game. You ever played a game and you're like, I don't even know what I'm doing. You know? You just roll your dice and you move your mice and you hope nobody gets hurt and then you die. The best you can hope for is a good, long, healthy life of love, peace, and joy. But don't count your chickens before, you, before they hatch because the worst happens to people every day, everywhere. We hurt each other. We put ourselves first, and even when we don't, even when we try to live a good life because there's something in us, like a conscience or something, that says, I ought to do good toward others. And even when we try to live good, we still suffer. We, we still get sick. We still die. So if the God rejecter is accurate in his assessment of the world, of life and eternity, then at death it's all over and it was all pointless. And we will be forgotten. Gone forever. What a terrible lot we are, humans on this wretched planet, if that is true. That's bad news, isn't it? I'm thankful I heard good news my whole upbringing. And I'm thankful, and I've said this before, but I had a drug problem growing up. My parents drug me to church. And my parents drug me to hear God's word. And my parents drug me, and I'm probably messing up the grammar again, but oh, you already know I'm not going to try to do well by that. But my parents drug me to places I could be within earshot of the greatest news the world has ever heard. 
And when I was 18 years young, I was a polished hypocrite of a person, a Pharisee in a suit on the outside, but I was a polluted, hell-bound sinner of a kid on the inside. And I realized I could not rescue myself. I realized I'm not inherently good. I'm not strong. There ain't no champion in here. God opened my eyes to the fact that I needed to trust the Lord Jesus Christ to save me from my sin. And guess what? I believed on Him. And I went beyond merely agreeing with facts about Jesus Christ as I had done for 18 years of my life. I agreed with facts about Jesus Christ, but I went beyond that and became aware that I must repent of my sin and my self-made efforts to be right with God. And I took a step of faith in my heart and my feet landed on the solid ground of what Jesus did for me and what Jesus did for you. He died for our sins to forgive us. And He rose again from the dead to clear our record. And He lives forevermore to be our Lord and Savior. Listen, my feet of faith landed on Jesus Christ the Lord. He saved me. He washed me. He made me new. And He can do the same for you. Your sins can be forgiven. Your life can have meaning. Your eternity can be secure. Your relationship with the living God can be real. You can be rescued. And that's why we exist as a church. We are a group of people who Jesus called out of this world and we heard His call and we turned, we repented of our sins and we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and He rescued us. And then we got dunked because we're Baptists. We are baptized to show everybody what happened in our hearts. We got baptized like Jesus baptized people, or had his disciples too, at least. And we joined our lives to not a perfect group of people, but his rescued people. And we love the good news about Jesus. None of us are perfect here. We're just forgiven. None of us are perfect here, but we are headed toward a perfect heaven. None of us are perfect here, but we have a perfect Father in heaven who loves us. We're a people rescued from our sins. Jesus Christ is our Lord. He came to save us. And I say along with Paul that God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached to the Gentiles, or among the nations He was believed on in the world and taken up into glory. And we are waiting and looking and longing for Him to come back. And He will come back. And He has set us free to serve Him and love people and do good works until that time. In our Sunday morning Bible study through Matthew, we have arrived upon teaching. You say, we're not in Matthew, we're in Isaiah. Hold, hold, the, hold the phone. We've arrived upon teaching Jesus gave His disciples about the end of the world and His coming. And He taught these truths on a mountain, the mount called Olivet. And we'll get back to the Gospel of Matthew soon. You say, define soon. No. But we are realizing that if we want to understand the future and what Jesus said about the future, we have to understand the past and what God said in the past. We are working through what we described as the rest of the story, the big picture, the storyline of the Old Testament, and we're letting God the Father's words in the Old Testament lay the foundation and set up the framework so that God the Son, Jesus, His words in the New Testament can fill that house with furniture. We want a clear, solid, livable understanding of what is coming in the future for us as the children of God. And you know I believe as Christians we could do a lot better understanding what is coming in the future. Sometimes we are too simplistic about heaven and what is coming. Sometimes we picture heaven like a far out there place where we will sprout wings, wear diapers, and float around on clouds playing harps. However, the picture of the kingdom of heaven that the Bible gives us is way better than that. And thank God, because I don't want to see any of you in a you-know-what. I read to you from Paul's letter in the church at Ephesus earlier from Ephesians chapter 1. And Paul prayed for those believers in Jesus that that church that belonged to Jesus, he prayed for them that God would open their spiritual eyes so they would know, they would know 
the hope of his calling and the riches of his glorious inheritance in them and the exceeding greatness of his power toward them. You say, I need power in my life to change. I need power in my life to live with hope. I need God's help and you can have it because of Jesus. God wants you to know fully and wonderfully everything that awaits you in his kingdom. He wants you to know clearly and joyfully just how eternally wealthy you became when you trusted Christ. You say, I don't have much. I, I drive a beater of a car and I, I feel like my house is a rundown shack. But yeah, if you have believed the gospel of Jesus Christ, you have wealth that you can't even understand in Jesus Christ. But we're going to try to help you understand. God wants you to know confidently and determinedly His great powers at work in me today. I can be what God wants me to be today. I don't have to check out. I can check in to what God wants me to be and do until he comes back. He wants you to know. He came to save you from sin and his rescue mission on earth happened. Read about it in the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But the rescue mission isn't over yet. And he wants you to know his plan to rescue this cursed planet from sin and death. He wants you to know that if you have trusted Jesus Christ, you, had a, you have an amazing part in that plan, in that mission. Isaiah had much to say about that rescue mission. Our title today is Emmanuel's Rescue Mission. You see, God inspired Isaiah to preach and write a beautiful message of hope and salvation in Judah. We're going to pick up here where we left off last week and plow ahead in this book. And I want to give a little note as we get going, that this was written over 2,700 years ago. Now, this is a book that we can trust because it came from God. In fact, 2,000 years ago, Jesus quoted Isaiah's words often. He often quoted Isaiah's words from both parts. You say both parts. Parts 1 through 39 and 40 through 66 feel like they have a different tone and a tenor if you read through them. But Jesus quoted from both and said, Isaiah said this. Isaiah spoke these words from God. Now, about 80 years ago, I'm just going to give you a little tidbit here, okay? And we're, we're getting there. Some scrolls were discovered in a cave called the Dead Sea Scrolls. And one of them, this happened in the land of Israel, in the area, one of them was a nearly full copy of this book, the book of Isaiah. And that copy of the scroll of Isaiah was dated to about 150 years before the time of Jesus. And that copy, when it was side by side compared to what we have in our Bibles and our lives today, it was pretty nearly exactly the same. You say, what are you saying? I'm saying that what we read in Isaiah today in the Bible in your lap is what Jesus read too. It's what he had. We have the same words. God has preserved his word in the world for all people throughout all generations. And copies of his word have been made by God-fearing people in all sorts of languages all over the world. We're blessed to have a reliable copy of what he said. And so I'm just saying to you today... That as we, sit, as we unpack the glorious message of God in this book, we are unpacking good news that we can sink our teeth into like a good steak. Who likes a good steak? Yes, These are words, this is good news that we can build our lives on like a firm foundation. These are words that we can proclaim to others like an exciting proclamation. And so let's just rejoice in this today. We're going to read the Bible today. And let's just rejoice in what it says, okay? Isaiah prophesied in the days of the four kings of Judah. Listen, Isaiah 1.1. 1, 1. All right, if you're in Isaiah 7, you can see those kings there. You can also read their names there in 1.1 1, 1, or on the front side of your handout, the chart, the kings and the prophets. See, Isaiah prophesied through the days of those four kings of Judah, the southern kingdom. And he also prophesied through the days, the last days of the northern kingdom, Israel. If you look on the back of your handout, on the top side you have Israel, on the bottom side you have Judah, and somewhere about the, uh, not quite the middle of the page, but on top you see it says the fall of Samaria, and there's what's supposed to be a star and a squiggly line down to the timeline. So Isaiah prophesied during those days when Samaria, Israel's capital city, it fell to this world-dominant empire called Assyria. 
And that happened while Isaiah was still prophesying to Judah. Now you say, what's all this about? Well, this southern kingdom, this northern kingdom, and why did this northern kingdom fall? Why were there two kingdoms? I mean, weren't these the people of God? Weren't these the Jews? And wasn't the Old Testament about the Jews? Weren't they supposed to be a blessing to all the nations? And then one of them was conquered by the nations? Didn't God promise Abraham, their father, their guy that started this all and made a covenant with him and his offspring that they would possess the land forever and that their descendants would be numbered like the stars in the heavens and that he would be their God forever? Didn't he tell them if they would truly obey what he said to them that they would be a special treasure unto him of all the people on the earth, a kingdom of priests, a holy nation? Well, you're not far off if that's what you're thinking. So that's not what I was thinking. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, I guess we have some more learning to do then. Keep on reading the Old Testament. Come around here often. But to the person trying to make sense of what was going on in Judah and Israel in the days of Isaiah, way back in their history, before they ever entered the promised land, Moses set before them a choice. A blessing or a curse. Life or death, obedience or disobedience, love for God or love for everything else. And if these people would listen intently to God's voice and obey his commandments, the Lord their God would bless them in incredible ways in that land he gave them and establish them as a special people for him. Go read Deuteronomy 28. But if they would not listen intently to the voice of God to obey his commandments, then the Lord their God would curse them in every way in their land. He would bring a nation from far away to siege them, and he would bring them to nothing, and he would pluck them from that land, and he would scatter them among the nations. In Isaiah's day, Israel had long chosen the curse, death disobedience, and love for everything else. In Isaiah's day, Israel was taken into captivity by Assyria, the dominant empire, and Judah was not far behind. As we saw last week, Judah was spiritually sick. Their sinful condition made God sick. He was disgusted by their worship and their religion because their capital city, Jerusalem, was full of murderers and liars and thieves. And Isaiah was saying, hey, come on, stop lifting up dirty hands in prayer to God. Wash your hands. Your hands are dirty because you worship God here, but then you go out in life and you hurt people. Wash your hands. Come back to God and God reason with them. Let me wash away your sins. We saw last week that God promised to purge Zion. Zion is another name for Jerusalem. God would purge Zion of the wicked leadership and the sinners who were there. He would restore the city to righteousness. And He promised that when He did that in the last days, the mountain of His house would be established and exalted above all mountains and hills. And nations would flow into Zion to the house of the God of Jacob so He could teach them His ways. The nations would desire, hey, let's walk in his paths and his law and his word would emanate and reverberate throughout the world from Zion and God would judge among the nations. Nations, there'd be peace because they'd take their weapons and they'd break them down and they'd make farm equipment. That means no more fighting. There'd be peace. Now, in order to have peace, idolatry would have to be dealt with. God's people could not worship idols. They couldn't worship fake man-made gods and the true God at the same time. That's the same for our world today. For peace to come on earth, idolatry must go. Either you abandon your idols now and have peace with God through Christ, or he will cast you and your idols into hell then. God spoke to the people of Judah in Isaiah's day that God would soon deal with their idolaters. He promised there was a day in which when he purged the land of all the junk, he would restore it. And he mentioned this branch, this beautiful, lovely branch that would grow and act like a protection for the people there in Zion, a shelter from heat and from storm and from rain. Of course, Isaiah had to keep preaching this until the judgment came. 
We landed last week at the end of chapter 6, and we saw that even though the land, this is what the land would be like when judgment came, even though the land would be like a tree cut down, and it's on the ground, and the, the land would be like a stump that was burnt, a holy seed, a holy offspring would spring up out of that stump, like fresh growth out of a burnt stump. Some people didn't want that hope, that fresh hope, that holy seed. In chapter 7, we become more acquainted with the wicked king Ahaz. God offered him hope. Some enemies came his way, Syria and Israel, and Ahaz faced those neighbor nations, and he was afraid of them. And God said to Ahaz, chill out, <laughs> more or less, I'll take care of it. And he told him, hey, ask me for a sign. I will prove that I will rescue you from your enemies. And yet, Ahaz, he was more interested in himself. He was more interested in playing political patty cake and forming an alliance, uh, an alliance with Assyria, the great world power of the day. You can see more about that throughout Isaiah and in 2 Kings 16. So he piously and hypocritically said, well, I don't want to ask God or tempt the Lord. And Isaiah told him more or less, Ahaz, you are trying out patience with your sin. Is that a small thing? Is it a small thing for you to weary men? How much more than it is to weary God? How much more to try the patience of God? And Isaiah told him that the Lord himself would give Ahaz a sign that God's people, Judah, would be saved from their enemies. Look at verse 14. He said, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name in Emmanuel. That name meant God with us. So that meant God would be among his people to save them from their enemies. And he would prove that he had come to save them through the miraculous birth of a baby boy by a virgin. Well, Ahaz was not interested in God's sign. In fact, he wasn't interested in babies. If you read in 2 Kings 16, he killed his own son on a fiery altar to false gods. So he wasn't interested in a baby boy that would be born, and he wasn't interested in God. In spite of his stupidity and unbelief, if you go on to read the next couple chapters, you'll discover that God promised to bring the king of Assyria into the land and the Assyrians would quickly judge and take away those enemies, God said, that would be removed. In fact, Isaiah and his wife had a son in chapter 8, verse 3, named Mahershalal Hashbaz. You say, mashed potatoes and gravy? Yep. I shouldn't have said that, because now some of you, that's all you're going to think about. The boy's name meant swift is the spoil, speedy is the plunder. In other words, God would use Assyria to quickly judge Judah's enemies and plunder Israel and Assyria, or and Syria. See, God was serious about that promised sign, Emmanuel. Assyria would be like a strong and a mighty river overflowing its banks so that the waters would come into Judah and threaten Jerusalem as well. You can read about that happening during the reign of the king following Ahaz, Hezekiah. Chapter 36 and 37 of Isaiah and 2 Chronicles 18 and 19, and 2, or I'm sorry, 2 Kings 18 and 19 and 2 Chronicles 32. Assyria would come in, they would wipe out Israel, and they would threaten Judah, but God would rescue Judah, of course. And Ahaz wanted to form political alliance with Assyria rather than trust God? He wanted to trust untrustworthy man over the Lord God who cannot lie? That's interesting, isn't it? And all the while, God's promises kept rolling off of Isaiah's tongue and pen. Go to chapter 9. Chapter 9, a familiar prophecy. It develops the prophecy about the son that would be born of a virgin and named Emmanuel. Verse 6, unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, from now on, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform 
this, this king to be born, this Emmanuel who would rule from the throne of David would multiply the nation and he would judge the enemies and he would establish a kingdom that would never stop growing and would never cease to have peace. And he would order that kingdom and he would establish it. And the creator God and his holy zeal, the God who has unstoppable angel armies, he would make sure this king would be crowned and this kingdom would be established just as he promised David in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Go to Isaiah chapter 11. Let's read on about the, this king, the prince of peace, his reign, his kingdom. We start to see some of these prophecies blend together. You see, in chapter 4, Isaiah spoke about this glorious branch who would be there for the remnant who would return to Zion. And then in chapter 9, he spoke about this king. Well, here in Isaiah 11, it's like the, the branch, that picture of the branch and the king, they come together. You see, they're the same thing. They're the same person. Isaiah 11, verse 1, there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. Who, who's Jesse? That was David's dad. A branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and shall make him of quick understanding and the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. That's quite powerful words and breath to kill people with. The wicked with. Righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. And his effect, and his reign would have such an effect even on the animal kingdom that hasn't been experienced since the Garden of Eden, that paradise that God set up on earth to begin in. He said in verse 6, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid. The kid there meaning a baby goat. And the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. I mean, picture this little kid, and here's a cow, and what have you got there? The young lion and the fatling, whatever the fatling is, some fat baby goat animal of some sort or the other. And here's this little child leading them along and the cow and the bear shall feeding. I mean, you, can you picture that? A cow and a bear feeding out of the same feeding trough and their young ones shall lie down together and the lion shall eat straw like the ox and the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. What does that mean? Babies are going to be playing with snakes. And the snakes aren't going to be messing with them. Now the babies will be swinging around because Christ conquered the snake. Amen? Okay, maybe that's just, that's my opinion. And he says, watch this, they shall not hurt nor, de nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. When the earth is full of the knowledge of the Lord, when this king reigns there, there's going to be unprecedented peace, un un peace unknown to man. No more destruction, no more pain. But watch this. Look at verse 10. This is, oh. And that day there shall be a root of Jesse which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek and his rest shall be glorious. What is an ensign? It's a banner. Picture a flag. A banner that an army would use to rally their troops to it. And this root that would be born, this branch, this king who would rule and judge the world in righteousness, he would be like a banner for all the nations of the world to come to him and to seek him. And he would give the nations rest. Glorious rest. But it wasn't just for the restless and weary people of the world at large. It was for God's covenant people, the Jews too. Because look at verse 11, it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, the Jews, which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and all these other places. And verse 12, he'll set up another banner for the nations and he'll assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. 
You need to mark that in your mind because Jesus is going to use terminology like that. He's going to gather his people, the Jews. So not only would this king, this branch of Jesse, the son of David who would judge righteously, not only would he surprisingly stand as a rallying point for all the peoples of the world, he would also recover the remnant of the Lord's people. The Lord's, as he would describe them in the Old Testament, his chosen, his elect people, Judah, from the four corners of the earth. And Israel, the northern kingdom, and Judah, the southern kingdom, though they had divided, they would no longer be at odds. They would be one people under God once again. And God would carve a highway for the remnant of his people to return back to Zion. Look at chapter 12. Listen to the joyful song the citizen of Zion would sing, Zion would sing in that day. In that day thou shalt say, O oh Lord, I will praise thee. Though thou wast angry with me, thine anger is turned away, and thou comfortest me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Therefore with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. And that day shall ye say, Praise the Lord. Call upon his name, declare his doings among the people, make mention his name's exalted, sing unto the Lord, for he hath done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Cry out and shout with excitement and praise, and joy, thou inhabitant of Zion. For great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. Who thinks that's going to be an exciting time? Amen. Go to Isaiah 25. Make haste, please. Say, what is haste? Hurry. Isaiah 25, we get a further glimpse of what God will do in that day in Zion. Who likes a good feast? Maybe even with rare who roast beast. Look at verse 6. And in this mountain in Zion shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things. That means there's going to be a lot of marbling in that steak. A feast of wines on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of wines on the lees, well refined. It sounds like quite the banquet. Verse 7, he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people and the veil that spread over all nations. What's this covering he's talking about? What's this veil? It's not masks. COVID masks. I heard someone suggest that's what this was. God's going to remove the COVID masks from everybody. Time out. Flag on the play. It's not what he's talking about. What's he talking about? Look at verse 8. He will swallow up death. The death veil. The death covering. He's going to destroy death and victory. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces. Have you lost somebody to death? Have you cried with anguish? Because your heart was broken. Well, in that day, in that mountain, he's going to destroy death once and for all and all tears will be wiped away. It says, the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth, for the Lord hath spoken it. Look at verse 1 of chapter 26. In that day, they would sing a song. You say, there's a lot of singing going on over there. Absolutely. There ought to be a lot of singing going on here as we journey there. In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Open ye the gates, that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. Now, I want to give you a little taste of what is coming. In Revelation, when the new Jerusalem comes down and God dwells among his people, the gates of that city will come and the nations of the saved will go in and out of that city. That's just a little taste of Revelation. Look at verse 3. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace. Oh, we sang about that today. Whose mind is stayed on thee. Because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever. For in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. For he bringeth down them that dwell on high. The lofty city, he layeth it low. He layeth it low even to the ground. He bringeth it even to the dust. The foot shall tread it down. Even the feet of the poor and the steps of the needy. The way of the just is uprightness. Thou most upright dost weigh the path of the just. Yea, in the way of thy judgments, O Lord, have we waited for thee. 
The desire of our soul is to thy name and to the remembrance of thee. With my soul have I desired thee in the night. Yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. For when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Go to chapter 32, please. Verse 15 picks up. Until the Spirit be poured upon us from on high, and the wilderness be a fruitful field, and the fruitful field be counted for a forest, then judgment shall dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness remain in the fruitful field. And the work of righteousness shall be what? Peace. And the effect of righteousness shall be quietness, and assurance forever. And my people shall dwell in a peaceable habitation and in sure dwellings and in quiet resting places. Look at chapter 33 and verse 20. Look upon Zion, the city of our solemnities. Thine eyes shall see Jerusalem, a quiet habitation, a tabernacle that shall not be taken down. Not one of the stakes thereof shall ever be removed, neither shall any of the cords thereof be broken. But there the glorious Lord will be unto us a place of broad rivers and streams, wherein shall go no galley with oars, neither shall gallant ship pass thereby, for the Lord is our judge. He is our judicial branch. The Lord is our lawgiver. He is our legislative branch. And the Lord is our king. He is our executive branch. And he will save us. And that day when God reigns and God rules in that place, he is all the government we, he, we will ever need. And he is perfect and there will be peace there. And it will be wonderful. Look at chapter 35 and verse 1. The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it. The excellency of Carmel and Sharon, they shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. And so he says, because of what's coming, he says, strengthen ye the weak hand. Confirm the feeble knees. Say, my hands are a little shaky. And my knees are a little feeble. And he says to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong. Fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened. And the ears of the deaf, the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as in heart, as a deer. Cripples are going to jump. And the tongue of the dumb sing, for in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. The parched ground shall become a pool and the thirsty land springs of water. And the habitation of dragons where each lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes. And in highway shall be there and a way and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those. The wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereon. It shall not be found there, but who's going to be there on that highway? To Zion. The redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. I want to ask you this morning. This is Emmanuel's rescue mission. And have you been rescued? You see, this Emmanuel, God with us, he was born of a virgin. And his name is Jesus Christ. And he will reign in righteousness from Mount Zion in Jerusalem, a real place. We're talking about a real person. And he will bring protection and peace and eternal rest. And he will deal with the nations of this world who are godless and wicked and corrupt and who oppress their people. And he will reign 
as the king of the kingdom of Almighty God, and he will come again and set up that kingdom, just as he came the first time to save the weak and the poor and the fearful. He will come again to rescue them, and he will heal again, just like he did when he came the first time. And he brings life to the dead, and he brings light, light to the darkness. And one day in his mountain, there's a highway there that if you are rescued by Jesus, your feet will walk on that highway right into the city of God where there's no need for any lights or sun or moon because God's the light and you will look on the face of God and have eternal rest. Yes, you, sinner. Have you let Jesus rescue you from your sin? If you aren't rescued, you're going to miss all of that. And I want to ask you, believer, isn't that going to be a time of peace and rest and joy that will never end? You're right. We ought to have a bad week this week because it's not like the best is yet to come. My dear friend, Miss Reese, I will say to her, did you have a good week? You bet. You bet. <laughs> and she says, yes, of course, because Jesus is Lord and I'm going to heaven. So Christian, let's rejoice. We're walking toward the kingdom. Let's pray together.